Oh, if you believe that, say amen. amen. This time of year, we all need to be singing that part about Jesus. You're my healer. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's good to see you. Merry Christmas. Man, that got here fast. How many of you think you got here a little too fast? Some of you. I'm sure you all got your shopping done. I made the mistake of waiting till yesterday. I just came home. <laughs> Found out you can get online and get it in two days. I'll pay the extra. <laughs> Praise God for the internet. <laughs> Some of y'all even look happy today. You okay? Yeah. <laughs> Some folks, they get to church and they think they're supposed to be sad for a little bit or something, you know. You say, want to know what they had for breakfast or did they get a shot or something? But we can come to Believer's Fellowship and be happy. Amen? Oh, come on, say amen, wake up. Stay in a funeral home. I know we've got a lot of folks out, a lot of folks traveling, just be praying for those. And then we've got a lot of folks that are just sick or in the hospital. I mean, be lifting these folks up. And most of you are on the prayer line, so you know about most of those needs. So this time we just need to be praying for each other. Stacy even got sick this week. I told her, stay away from me. Don't bring her to the office. <laughs> you get sick around here, stay away from me. I can't afford it. Amen? Some of y'all, I'm going to wait until y'all wake up, all right? I want to make sure you're alive and kind of stand on the porch here for a minute till you let me in. Yeah, all right. Are we in now? Praise God. All right. Where's that little weather control device? You always see the weathermen hold these, you know? Okay. Coming from the north. <laughs> put a green screen back here and do some of that. Hey, just bear with me. I drank too much coffee this morning. And somebody gave me a Sudafed on top of that, so that's, that's like speed for me, you know. I mean, <laughs> so, we've been talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. I hope that some of you are convinced now. All right, he's coming and he's coming in. We're not going to stop about talking about that. This is the, the day, the Sunday before Christmas. So I thought we just, uh, as I mentioned last week, kind of bring these two things together and do a, do a message that deals with both of these tasks about the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. So we're going to do a comparison as well as a contrast, all right? So uh, we're going to take some things that we've seen in Scripture and compare them uh, in regard to the second coming and the prophecy study that we've been doing and compare them to the first coming. And also there's about five things I want to show you kind of in a, in a comparison, but kind of more of like a contrast to, to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the first coming. We believe that he came the first time. We ought to be assured of the fact that if God prophesied, promised that he's coming the first time, God is not a liar. He's faithful. And what he said he would do, he will do. So let's look today and, and, and look at the first coming and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me give you about seven quick points in, in comparison as we look at this today because there's some things that are uniquely very much and very similar. Obviously, we'll start with the first one, that both events are prophesied and spoken by the prophets in Scripture. In fact, for every one prophecy concerning the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's eight. Those who are into biblical numerology, I don't believe in coincidences. Eight's the number of the new beginning. So that when he does come the second time, it's going to be a new beginning. It's going to wrap up the old, start with the new. It's going to be a glorious time. But it's interesting when you study the scripture and look at what the prophets said of Jesus Christ and his first coming and his second coming, especially in the Old Testament, there was some confusion, I think, uh, amongst those who were looking for this moment because in on one hand talking about a suffering Savior and the other hand the prophet speaking of a reigning Messiah. But let's look at what the scripture has. Uh, the prophets do speak of a great king who would come in the Old Testament who would be both human and divine. In fact, Isaiah tells us in chapter 7 that this coming Messiah would be born of a virgin. He went on to say in Isaiah that he would be despised, forsaken, stricken, pierced through crushed, chastened, scourged, oppressed, and afflicted. But he goes on to say in Isaiah, and the government will rest upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. He went on to say that there would be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace in Isaiah chapter 9. He goes on in Isaiah to talk about him being called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And even in Matthew, when the angels announced the birth of the Lord Jesus, they said, and he shall be called Emmanuel. The difference between where they said he'd be named Jesus 
and you'll call his name Jesus, but what he would be known as and what he would be called would be Emmanuel. And certainly Jesus is God with us. Daniel speaks of him in Daniel chapter seven of being one like the son of man. Micah spoke of him and he promised that he'd be born in Bethlehem. In Micah 5, 2, he says, for from you one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. His going forth are from a long ago, from the days of eternity. And what is he saying there? He's saying that he's going to come, he'll be born in Bethlehem, but he's been around a long time. He's speaking of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Zephaniah tells the people of Israel that when this king comes, he will be the king of Israel and the Lord in your midst. Zechariah spoke of him and he said to us, he will be just and endowed with salvation in chapter nine, verse nine. That's certainly the Lord Jesus Christ. He is just and endowed and given to us salvation. In fact, it says that when he reigns on the earth, that every family on the earth will be able to go up to Jerusalem and worship the king, the Lord of hosts. He tells us in Zechariah 14, that this coming king, all the prophets spoke of him as being a king, a man, but yet God. Now, as they looked at this and spoke as being led by the Holy Spirit and wrote as being unctionized by the Holy Spirit to write these inspired words to us, they probably didn't fully understand. In fact, if you look at the New Testament, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter one, that the prophets didn't fully comprehend the full nature of the one whom they prophesied. Peter wrote it like this, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, they made careful search and inquiry, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ, that is Messiah, within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and then the glories to follow. Didn't quite gel for some of them. The majority, that's number one, that he was prophesied in the Old Testament, New Testament. The second point I want to make to you in comparison is this, the majority of the religious crowd of the day knew the Messiah was coming, but they ignored it. Well, obviously you can compare that to today. There's a lot of people who know about the coming of Jesus Christ, but they ignore it. Jesus warned about this when he wrote in Matthew, when he spoke in Matthew, he says, for this reason you be ready to, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think he will. How many of you think that Jesus will come right this hour? Most of you don't, tell the truth. <laughs> and some of you said, yes, I'm not sure you're really convinced. <laughs> so that means he could come right now. <laughs> All right, when you don't think he will. Who then is the faithful and the sensible slave whom his master has put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? By the way, that's us. We're supposed to be those sensible servants of Christ who in charge of the household. He goes on to say, blessed is the slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. Unfortunately, many are like that slave who is dishonorable and not worthy. How can we often be charged with that indictment of not looking, not expecting, not believing, not longing for, not hoping. We get so wrapped up in this world that we live in that we get disenchanted and preoccupied and disoriented, so to say, spiritually in our life that we're not looking any more than those who were alive on the earth when Jesus came. All the Jewish folks of the day, the rabbis, the synagogue leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they knew these prophets. They knew what Zechariah spoke and Isaiah, all these words of God and much more that we're probably even more familiar with for them than they are to us. But yet when they came, they ignored it. Not everybody, there was Zacharias, obviously, you know, had been prophesied, the father of John, and then there was Simeon who saw and he knew and he believed, but for the most part, they were not ready. In fact, in Matthew 2, the Pharisees were called into Herod's court. Men had come from the east. They were called the Magi. I remember we talked about them in seasons past at Christmas about these kingmakers. They show up at Herod's court. They're inquiring about the Messiah. They've seen his sign in the east and they're saying, where is he that's born this king of the Jews? Herod says, I think I've heard about that. <laughs> I got some guys who are a little more well-informed in that department. Let me call in the religious leaders of the day. And they inquire and they tell him about the prophets that we've just read from, that the king would be born in Bethlehem. 
And so the Magi and their group, they gathered together and they head where? To Bethlehem. Following them, no one. <laughs> you would think that the others would follow. You would think that someone from the Pharisaical group, the Sanhedrin, somebody would say, oh, maybe it is time. Maybe we better go check this out. But they're like so many today. They, they're not checking out anything. They ignored what was going on. When all these signs and all these scriptures and all these, these direction was given them, they ignored it, much like the church in the world does today. We just go about our affairs. Jesus said it'll be like the days of Noah, marrying, giving marriage, going about your business, about the trade of life, and not really keeping the cognizant thing before us of Jesus is coming, and he is coming very soon. The third point in regard to our comparison is this. The known world was under dominion of one man at this time. They thought he was God, and so it will be in the last days. Antichrist will be the same as like a Julius Caesar, a Caesar Augustus, you know, in Luke chapter two, it tells us that he put out a decree in those days. The decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the census should be taken of the whole inhabited earth. Now, you have to understand about the Caesars of Rome. They believed that they were deity. They believed and, and, and expected people to honor them as God. They had taken their seat of authority and the world was under their control and under their dominion. And they considered themselves to be God. That's why the persecution was so hard upon the first century Christians. They didn't mind you worshiping multiple gods. This pantheism was accepted, but not monotheism. Not that there's only one God. And by the way, you're not it. That didn't go so well. But in the end of times, in the second coming of Jesus, it will be the same. We talked about last week and weeks before about the Antichrist in Second Thessalonians. He said, we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure. Don't be disturbed by messenger or spirit or by letter. And he starts talking that. We dealt with it last week because they had, were concerned that they might be living, you know, that they'd miss the rapture. And he said, listen, the Antichrist hasn't come. And he gave that little description of him that we shared last week, who declares himself to be God. Daniel spoke of him when he said he'll go into the temple, declare himself to be God, the abomination of desolation, that he desecrates that holy place in the temple and declares himself to be God. And he will do the same as Caesar Augustus. He will expect a census and a numbering and literally not just to be numbered, but you will be numbered with a number. You will have to take a mark, whether it's in your hand or your forehead, whether it's a biochip or whatever it is, that will identify you as an honorable citizen who recognizes that he's the leader of the world. In fact, three and a half years into his, into his time of existence, he will declare himself to be God. Revelation 13 talks about him and it says, he causes all men small and great. He causes them all men, small and great, rich and poor, free men, slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand and are on their forehead. And he provides that no one should be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number of that man is, and his number is 666. So just as there was in the days of Jesus' first coming, one who declared himself to be God over all things, so it will be when Jesus comes the second time. The third comparison is this. There was a fiery sign that accompanied his coming. So will there be at his second coming. In Matthew chapter two, remember, the, the Magi come in and they ask Herod, where's this one born king of the Jews? Because we have seen his star, or the way it's translated in the King James, I mean, it translates his star. Others say sign, and star doesn't literally mean a physical star. It means a fiery sign. We have seen his sign, his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. We've dealt with this at Christmas's past about the star of Bethlehem and what is the star of Bethlehem. Always comes up at every Christmas. I was sitting there listening to a preacher talk to somebody on the phone. I was getting uh, my truck a window fixed on my truck while I was waiting to get my truck back. He was telling, oh, I heard so-and-so, and he's talking about the star of Bethlehem and, you know, this comet and all these things. And he was given all this scientific research, which isn't very scientific if you just look at the 
scientific logic of it, that it, that it literally was a comet or a star. There's no way logically that a star can fit the parameters of what the king saw. They saw his sign in the east, all right? And so they come to Jerusalem to find Jesus the king, because why? Jerusalem is the center of authority and power. So they come to the right place. They, they respond. And then they are sent to Bethlehem. It wasn't that they followed this little starry trail and it kind of led the, you know, it's this light in the road. You all have seen the commercial, you know, where do you buy a car? Where do you find the investments? And the little start sign shows up on the sidewalk or whatever. And they follow the green line or whatever it is. It wasn't like that, all right? When you follow the story fully and completely, you'll see this revelation, this fiery wonder is given. Believe, I believe, and many believe, that it was the same kind of sign that appeared, you know, on Mount Sinai with the glory and the lightning and the thunder and the flashes and the fire. The same sign that showed up at the dedication of the tabernacle in the wilderness when the fiery sign fell over the, the Holy of Holies. And how God led the children of Israel through the wilderness with that fire by night and that cloud by day. That same sign, I believe, is the sign we're talking about here with Jesus. A revelation, a sign, a light, a brightness declaring the glory of God. I believe it's a sign at the second coming that when Jesus reveals himself, there's gonna be this glorious manifestation of light and wonder and glory, I believe, around the globe. Matthew 24, 27 puts it like this. It says, for as the lightning comes out of the east and shines even into the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. I believe it's the same wondrous light that appeared to the shepherds. In Luke chapter two, in verse eight, there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and catch this, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. This manifestation of beautiful, fiery light and brilliance, this glory, this manifestation of God, we refer to it sometimes as the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah, this glorious manifestation. In 1 Peter 5, 4 says, and when the chief shepherd appears, you, will, you shall receive an unfading crown of glory. These shepherds were in awe of this light, this glory that breaks forth before them. And then the angels come and they're singing and they're announcing the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe it's the same sign that will accompany him in the end of time. The fifth thing here about the comparisons and the contrast of the Lord Jesus Christ would be this. He was sought by wise men to recognize him as a king, but at the second coming, the really true wise men will receive their king. There's coming a day, much like the first, when there was this fiery revelation that few saw and comprehended on some level. And we talked about those wise men as being the children and the heritage of Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego who were in Babylon, who were in Persia, who became leaders. And we know that Shadrach and Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all of them were rulers. Daniel was made the second ruler of the kingdom, all right? They, as we said, were the kingmakers. If you want some more information on that, you can go to our website and probably find some sermons. Go to our YouTube channel and you'll find sermons from last year and the year before where we deal with that issue of who were these wise guys and what were the starry skies really all about. But they come and they're to recognize who this King of Kings is and this Lord of Lords is. They were a ruling class from Persia. They were the, the king makers of the day in that world. And they came to recognize the true king of kings and they were ready to enthrone him as king as they brought him kingly gifts. Today, if you're truly a wise man, you'll be seeking out this king of kings to come soon. And when he does come, we will be, the Bible calls us, we will be recognized as kings as well and priests. And if we are truly wise, we'll give our hearts and life to him and be enthroned by him to reign with him as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And we too, according to scripture, if we are his children, we'll be given crowns. And what we will do with those crowns, according to the word of God, is there'll be a glorious time of celebration in heaven where we'll all cast our crowns that he's given to us unto him and at his feet and announce his glory before us. What a great day that's gonna be, amen? There's another comparison I don't want you to miss today. The sixth comparison is like this. The angels will announce both events. 
Angels to Mary announced the event. Angels with Joseph announced the event. Angels to the shepherd. Wise men warned by angels. You see the ministry of the angels taking place. But as the Bible tells us, at his second coming, there will be also an angelic announcement that at his second coming, that he will come with the trump and the voice of the archangels. The angels were the ones who stood there as Jesus was ascending after the resurrection and after his days with the disciples. As he ascends into heaven, the angels are the one who tell them, hey, this same Jesus will come again in like manner. That as you've seen him ascend into this cloud, which again, that fiery cloud, it was a cloud by day and a fire by night. As he ascends into that cloud, he's going to come back in clouds of glory. Another interesting comparison I kind of dug out of these, these last days, and this is seven of the comparisons, and there's probably 700 when you really dig it a little bit deeper. But he was sought out to be destroyed, remember, at the first coming. And at the second coming, it's pretty much the same. Satan still is seeking to destroy him. He hates God. And that final gathering at Armageddon will be that moment when he's seeking to hopefully bring down the king of kings. In Matthew 2, it tells us the story of Herod. After the wise men leave and do not report back because angels did warn them, remember that Herod sent a troop into Bethlehem and there was this slaughter that took place of all these innocent lives. All these babies were killed because Herod didn't want any competition for the throne. And just the same way, at the end of time, Antichrist is going to appear and he's going to appear at the Valley of Megiddo at Armageddon, that great battle where the blood's going to rise to the horses' reins. And he's going to be there with the armies of the world and whether they have been brought there under clear understanding of what's going on, the ultimate goal of Satan here is to do battle against God. Well, as one army prepares, so does another. Remember the rapture's taken place. All those who've been saved are now with Jesus Christ. Now he's coming back at the end of seven years. And we're going to appear with him in the air, in the sky, as we're mounted with him and we're coming back in full battle array. The Bible says Jesus comes riding on a white horse, sword at his side, vesture dipped in blood. And when he appears, the scripture tells us that he, according to 2 Thessalonians, he will destroy the enemy with the brightness of his glory and the two-edged sword that goes out of his mouth, the word of God, and Satan will be destroyed at that moment. The Antichrist will be killed. Now, Satan is just cast into a pit. And we'll talk about that maybe some more next week for a thousand years during the millennial reign of Christ. But the enemy is conquered at this point. Now the glorious thing about it is, we will be there, front row seats, seeing everything that takes place, riding in victory, gloriously coming back with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, well, I don't ride. That's part of the glorified body. Comes with it. What a moment. You know, some of you are looking like I'm crazy. I believe that moment's coming. And the world, when they hear that, they laugh that off. That's ridiculous. It's almost ridiculous as the first time some Muslim told me, you know, well, you know in, in the last of days that Muhammad's going to return and he's going to tie a camel hair to the top of the Dome of the Rock and that big minaret up on the Mount of Olives. And Muhammad's going to walk that camel hair and come into Jerusalem. That's absurd. You say, what's the difference? The difference is one's a liar and one's the truth. The difference is one's a man, the other one's God. The difference is Jesus, the Lord of lords and King of kings, and his book is an eternal book. The difference is his book is filled with truth. The Quran is filled with lies. That's the difference. I know that's not politically correct. Just put me in the same camp with Phil Robinson. <laughs> but I believe the Bible's the word of God. And it won't be Duck Dynasty, it'll be Jesus Dynasty, amen? <laughs> King of kings, Lord of lords, reigning in glory. Now, that's a few of the comparisons. But let me draw a few contrasts as well. There are five I want to point out just quickly. They'll go faster than the seven. Few knew of the actual event and place of his first coming. But in contrast, when he comes again, everybody's going to know it. It won't take the British Broadcasting Network, CNN Global Network, Fox News, ABC News. Not gonna have any need for the news, all right? 
it's just going to be everybody's going to know that something's going on. Matthew 24 says, and the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. You say, what's the sign of the Son of Man? Let me say it again. The sign, let me tell you what it is, the Son of Man. He is the sign. Yes, there'll be the glory, there'll be the trumpets, there'll be the angels, there'll be the Shekinah manifestation, the clouds and the fire, but he is the sign. It's all about him. He will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of, of the earth will mourn. And I'll explain that in a moment. When they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with great power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky unto the others. Revelation puts it like this in verse one. Behold, he comes with clouds. That's that glory again. And every eye shall see him. And all the, also they which pierced him and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. They'll well for a reason, and we'll talk about it in just a moment, because of the judgment that's to come. It's not going to be a glorious moment if you're on that side of the coming. If you're not on the upside coming down, it's going to be a difficult time. The second contrast is this. He was sought out by shepherds as a child at the first coming. At the second coming, he is the chief shepherd coming with and for his children, coming with to establish his kingdom with his children. And this is a glorious moment. Remember the story of the shepherds in the field and the angels and the manifestation of God's presence and they're drawn up to Bethlehem to, to go and see where this is taking place and they get there and they come and they bow down and they worship Jesus. And they go their way following it, telling everybody they can about what is going on, what's happened. Not so many there. But the second coming, here is the one who they went as shepherds to see. He's the king. He is the shepherd. He is the great shepherd. He is the chief shepherd. And he's going to come and shepherd his family and his kingdom to the end of days. What a great moment in time. When we talk about Christmas, you've got to get the whole story, all right? Because it's about the coming of the Lord. Although we understand it in two phases, it's about the coming of the Lord. That's why we ought to be extremely excited about Christmas. The third contrast is here. At the first coming of Jesus Christ, we saw the slaughter of those innocent babies by Herod's armies and pursuit of the innocent Christ. He flees into Egypt, but at the second coming, there's going to be judgment of the unrighteous. They tried to slaughter him. They tried to kill him even as an instrument. But the second time, the judgment's going to fall upon the unrighteousness of this earth, of this creation, upon mankind. It's not going to be a glorious moment, this glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. For us who are saved, it is the blessed hope. For us that are saved, it is something we rejoice, we get excited about. It should motivate us. To, to be more in love with Jesus and to serve Christ more. But for those who are not right, that's why I read from these verses in Matthew, there will be mourning and there will be weeping upon the earth because judgment has arrived. Judgment that no one expected. Judgment they thought was set aside. Judgment that they thought was foolish. But they'll know and they'll clearly see what's going on. The fourth contrast is this. First time he came, lowly Jesus, baby, suffering servant, born in a stable. Second time he comes, he's coming as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Coming not as a baby Jesus, wrapped in swaddling clothes. I mean, I love those Christmas songs. They are silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, you know. Little baby Jesus lying in a manger, you know. No crying he makes. Boy, isn't that the perfect baby. <laughs> I'm sure Jesus cried, all right. He's still human. He's still God. We know Jesus wept at Lazarus' grave. You can be sure, you know, that he did dirty his diapers. All right? He was a, he was a man baby. And those are great, beautiful stories. We think about baby Jesus lying in a manger, you know. Uh, my, my granddaughter, she comes to church up here, and, she, you know, when they're, they're visiting over here. She, and she always wants to go see baby Jesus, you know. And she just, she's at the house. She's looking at the manger, you know, and she sees little baby Jesus lying. Picks up little baby Jesus, give him a little kiss. You know, everybody wants to kiss baby Jesus. But when he comes again, see him riding on that white horse. See him coming 
is a warrior, king, leading in battle. And he comes now to execute judgment and righteousness. And he comes now not as lowly servant, suffering on the cross for our sins, but coming to implement his kingdom over all creation and restore all things back in righteousness as the Lord of glory. Isaiah prophesied this. Daniel prophesied this. Ezekiel prophesied this. The New Testament is filled with reference after reference about the lordship of Christ and that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord, King of kings and Lord of lords. The fifth and the final comparison, I guess, a contrast is ended with him going up. His reign on earth did that first moment of ministries. The second one, he is coming down. Be sure, be ready. This same Jesus who you saw depart will come again in like manner. Going up, coming back. Going up, coming down. Establish his kingdom. A thousand years to show mankind what peace on earth really can be when the king of kings, who is the prince of all peace, comes and reigns from the seat of the throne of David in Jerusalem. We have great cause to celebrate. And we ought never lose sight of the fact, especially at Christmas, that he did come. But what a promise we have now. God honored his word in this regard. Will he not honor the rest of the word? Will he honor the one of those prophecies about him, Christ's coming? Will he not honor that eight for every one where he mentions again that he's coming again? The king's coming. Jesus is coming. We should be ready. What would be more appropriate this Christmas that we celebrate, that we be truly honestly remembering our Lord and Savior, truly honoring and remembering what this is really all about, why we are here, why we're here now in this day, in this generation. What does God have me on the planet for? What on earth am I here for? I'm here for him. I'm here to announce his coming. I'm here to cause people to hear and to understand that Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords and he gave himself up for us all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes him will not perish but have everlasting life. We should be aware and we should be ready. And we should be aware of the fact that we can still make a difference, that it's still not too late, that God still can do mighty things. God is still reaching people. God is still saving people. You say, well, I don't see anybody getting saved. That's because you're not reaching them. If you want to see them saved, then you have to tell them. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by Christians speaking the word so that they can hear. Let's be faithful. You want to do something for the glory of God? You want to do something to honor Jesus at this season of the year? Tell somebody about Christ. And keep on telling someone about Christ. Keep on honoring God in this way. Because I believe the day is coming when we're either going to be exalted with him or we're going to suffer the condemnation. Next week, I started not to preach this uh, next week. I was going to change the message, but I'm, I'm sticking with it because I believe it's what the Lord wants me to do. I was, I was going to preach on heaven. Everybody likes heaven, don't they? But everybody's talking about heaven, but nobody wants to go there like they're saying. Heaven's glorious time. We'll talk about it some other time, but next week we're going to talk about that final events on the planet before we step into eternity of eternities. When all the world is brought before God and the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the angelic host are gathered and we are gathered and all men from all time in history, everyone stands before God's great white throne. I just get chill bumps thinking about it. Stands before his great white throne. And there are, Jesus spoke of this, the apostles spoke of it, the prophets of old spoke of it, that every man will be judged. We're either under the blood or we're not under the blood. We've either come to Christ or we haven't come to Christ. And we'll open up the scripture. The Bible says in God will open up the book, the Lamb's book of life. And whose name is not written therein? If your name's not in that book, then you have no hope. How do you get your name in that book? I get, I get letters a lot from different corporations and Dunn and Bradstreet and stuff like that. We want to recognize you in the who's who. You're in a book, yeah, a book of who's who. Basically, they're saying, give us some money and we'll put your name in a book. So you can say, hey, my name's in a book. 
Hey, that book doesn't mean a hill of beans. All right? The book that means something is the Lamb's Book of Life. And on September 27, 1973, probably about 8.35 at night, they flipped open that book and wrote my name in it. There's no eraser on that pen. All right? No mark out, no whitey out, none of that stuff. And my name's in there. Because my name's in there, when that great throne of judgment day comes, I'm safe. If your name's not in there because you've, you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're not safe. You need to give your life to Jesus. You need to surrender your heart to Christ. And that can take place right here, right now. See how you do that? Same way I did it, and same way everybody's ever gotten saved has done it. A recognition that I've offended God, that I'm a sinner, that all men are sinners. And a recognition that Jesus Christ did come the first time to give you and I the opportunity to be forgiven of our sins and take our place in death because the wages of sin is death. And he died on the cross. And when he died on the cross, it was for me and it was for you. But there is, it's kind of like at Christmas when you get a gift. It won't do you any good unless you open it. God has given us this great gift of his son. And the opening of it means that I'm committing myself to him. Just as I unwrap that paper, take off that bow, open that box, see that gift, I'm committing my life to Jesus Christ. That has not happened you being good, you being in church, you being religious, you being Baptist, you being Catholic, you being Methodist, it's not going to work. Because on that day, Jesus said, many will say unto me, the two there's dealing with, many will say unto me, oh, didn't we do this, and didn't we do that, and didn't we cast out demons, and didn't we, go to, didn't we give to missions? And he will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I don't know you. Not in my contact list. You're not on my safe sender. <laughs> I don't know you. I praise God and the Lamb. There are many of us in this room who don't have to fear that day because we've done what God's required is to faith follow Jesus. If that's, if that's not you, what would stop you today? You say, but well, Brother Joe, I go to church at Believer's Fellowship. It's not good enough. But Brother Joe, I, I, I'm in a great lift group with lots of Christians. You can say, Brother Joe, I teach a lift group. So what will be the answer on that day? Didn't you know Jesus personally? Did you follow Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you have a commitment that's been made? But hey, I, I had a revelation. Good for you. lady told me today that she saw angels. I said, well, that's great. But if you don't see Jesus, it's not going to change anything. You've got to give your heart to Christ. But I had this wonderful experience. I've had lots of experiences. The only thing that's ever saved me is Jesus. Brother Joe, I'm a deacon. Well, bless your heart. The jails are full of them. <laughs> Amen. I'm an elder. So what? Do you know Jesus? My mama's a Christian. You don't get it by osmosis. Do you know Jesus? What better way than on this Sunday before Christmas to open the gift that God sent to you? Give your life to Christ today. And what better day that if we are Christians and we do know Christ, to get on fire for God. Just to get on fire for Jesus. Just to fall back in love with him so that he's first in our heart and our life. It's who we talk about. It's who we think about. It's who we're excited about. It's who makes the difference in my marriage. He's the one who makes a difference in my life. He's the one who makes a difference in my, my use of my time, my talents, my treasures. He's the center of my life. Get back to that place in your life. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Father, you are a great, great God.